When many people today think of the deep Italian South, of regions like Calabria or Sicily, they might at worst think of mafioso violence, crime, and exploitation. At best, they romanticize images of this more rugged area of Italy, with its colorful folklore, blue ocean waters, active volcanoes, gorgeous ruins from antiquity, and the food. Of course, the food. Ripe tomatoes, orange groves, pistachios, granita, arancini, the list goes on and on. The most southern regions of Italy are a far cry from the industrial chic Milan, the grandeur of Rome, and even the punchy hubbub of Naples. Recently, TV fanatics got a delectable taste of Italy's most southern locales from Mike White's second season of White Lotus. A satire of wealthy, unsavory American vacationers in Taormina, Sicily. In it, characters encounter the best and worst stereotypes of Southern Italy. Its topography, mystery, and folklore served as eye-candied metaphors for their own sexual exploits, expressions of toxic masculinity, and various forms of scandalous power struggle and intrigue. It's hardly a coincidence that the series weaves in Italian opera as a central thematic motif. The Italian South has long been subject to wild artistic interpretations and much of this fascination with this ill-known area of Italy and its citizens began in earnest in the late 19th century with the Verismo movement. Verismo, or Italian realism, was a late 19th century movement in literature, sciences, and music that was particular to Italy. Verismo was distinctive from other forms of realism because it focused largely on the lives of impoverished citizens, largely men, in Sicily and southern regions of the peninsula, especially Calabria. In addition to featuring southern geographies and characters, Verismo typically features violence, human vice, and the play between art and real life. The operatic Verismo movement lasted from approximately 1890 to the late 1910s. Both Pietro Mascagni and Ruggiero Leoncavallo are considered members of the Giovane Scuola, or the Young School, a cohort of young up-and-coming Italian composers that were part of the generation following Giuseppe Verdi. Along with Mascagni and Leoncavallo, primary composers of this young school included Puccini, Giordano, and Cilea. Musically, Verismo operas often feature expansive or untraditional uses of musical sound, expanded orchestral forms, and greater use of free verse and open forms to create natural, flexible modes of conversational and dramatic expression. Interestingly, music critics originally thought Verismo was entirely incompatible with opera, a genre considered highly idealistic and aesthetically romantic at the time. This talk today considers this quality of incompatibility that has persisted from the past to the present to show how the Italian South has been shaped by socially, politically, and artistically motivated fictions. After briefly setting the scene to discuss why the Italian South was subject to such intense stereotypes, I will approach Cavalleria through the lens of tinta, or aspects of Mascagni's local color, based in use of language and musical gestures in his opera. I then tackle an important theme within Verismo and stereotypes of the Italian South, troublesome expressions of masculinity, as a way to discuss both the shocking history and keen stylistic choices made by Leon Cavallo in Pagliacci. Following Italian unification in 1861, citizens were confronted with continual rises in crime, poverty, and violence, and were troubled by the lack of cultural cohesiveness that characterized their new Italy after existing for centuries as separate nation states. The nation's path towards industrialization and modernization was slower than its northern counterparts in France, Germany, and England, and such efforts were highly regionalized, fragmentary, and often met with resistance. Because of this, an overwhelming sense of superficiality and marginalization affected the new struggling country. Most artistic efforts to advance the Italian state developed within Turin, the capital of the Regno d'Italia, and Milan, the industrial powerhouse of the country. Together, these northern cities were the centers of intellectual, economic, and techn technological progress during this time. Both significantly also boasted impressive publishing industries. These cities thus became dominant forces in the construction of a unified Italy. As both Nelson Moe and John Dickey have observed, many northern intellectuals viewed the southern half of Italy, 
called the Mezzogiorno, as uncivilized because of its agrarian economy, as well as its comparatively high rates of illiteracy and crime. Mo elaborates. The dual vision of a backward and picturesque South was consolidated in the minds of nation's elites. On the one hand, the South was figured as the region that deviated from and resisted the construction of the unitary state, usually conceived as a nation aligned with modern European civilization. On the other hand, the South was figured as a reservoir of customs and traditions that the modernizing nation was gradually eliminating and for which the middle classes often felt a certain nostalgia. In both cases, a process of imaginative displacement takes place. The Mezzogiorno becomes a privileged site, whether of criminality, uh, feudal residues, corruption, and superstition, or of quaint peasants' popular traditions, folklore, and exotica. Published scientific studies, along with economic writings, fictional works, periodicals, published photographs, and magazines created by Northern writers form stereotypes of the South and its people as exotic, antiquated, and dangerously passionate. Intriguingly, many of Verismo's mo most avid proponents, including the most famed Verismo writers Giovanni Verga and Luigi Capuana, along with Leon Cavallo, were from the Italian South. All three of them relocated to northern cities, either temporarily or permanently, during their careers to seek greater visibility and opportunity. Conventional portrayals of the South were widely appealing to northern audiences uh, as well. By and large, these regional stereotypes served as a foundation for the construction of Italian Verismo. On May 17, 1890, a half-empty house at the Teatro Costanzi in Rome awaited the premiere of Pietro Mascagni's first opera. While the crowd was modest, the people that were there mattered. Among the premiere's attendees were important music critics, as well as Queen Margarita of Savoy. Though the scene of Cavalleria Rusticana's premiere was somewhat unassuming, the work nevertheless received countless curtain calls on the night of its first performance and became an immediate sensation. This evening, in turn, launched the operatic Verismo movement. A decade after its premiere, a Roman journalist reflected on the impact of this sensationally successful opera in an article entitled The Direction and Promises of Italian Art. Audiences had to realize that it was the natural consequence of a new attitude of spirits. It seemed healthy to return to the pure and raw and naked, very naked, reality. The heroic era was declining. Verdi and patriotism had used and abused scepters and swords and tyrants. Romanticism had tired us with eternal languors. Mascagni's one-act work featured neither nobles nor pompous heroes of a generation prior. Cavalleria's peasant characters and working-class Sicilian environment articulated a new aesthetic perspective for audiences. Idealism became trite. The echoes of the Italian Risorgimento were certainly outdated by the turn of the 20th century. With its layered soundscapes, streamlined drama, declamatory vocal lines, and use of local dialect, Mascagni's Verismo opera eschewed the romanticism of a previous era. The plot of Cavalletti Rusticana is derived from Giovanni Verga's short story and play of the same name. Verga, regarded among the forefathers of literary Verismo in the 1870s, published stories to northern Italian audiences about the ordinary lives of impoverished citizens in his hometown of Catania, a port city on the east coast of Sicily. Verga published Caval Cavalleria in Vita di Campi, or Life in the Country, in 1880, which was a collection of novellas and short stories all set in Sicily. Also included in this volume is a letter from Verga to fellow, fellow writer Salvatore Farina. In it, he lays the groundwork for Italian Verismo. Quote, in its living contours, Verga describes, stories, quote, will preserve no imprint of the mind that brought it to life, no shadow of the imagination that first conceived it, end quote. Works of Verismo should appear as natural or as true to reality as possible. In 1884, Verga adapted the short story as a play. The play was such a hit that Mascagni and his librettist Giovanni Targioni Torzetti 
Cho's Verga stage adaptation is the foundation for his entire 1888 uh, Sonzonio competition for young opera composers. They hoped that the play's popularity would appeal to the Milanese judges and northern Italian audiences, and evidently did. Taken in full, the fast-paced layered scenes of Cavaletti Rusticana create a kaleidoscopic soundscape, capturing the many shades of human complexity that underlie even the simplest bucolic setting. In creating a multifaceted operatic version of Verismo, Mascagni also reinforces the troubling and political undertones of this artistic movement as well. The opera's hymns, antiphons, and songs of celebration provide an idealistic sonic backdrop that is constantly juxtaposed with the dark, richly vocal drama of the local Sicilian characters, offering a pessimistic regional view of Italian realism. This mixture of expressive registers complements contemporary images of Southern Italy, the Mezzogiorno, that were often conjured up by Northern Italian journalists, photographers, and intellectuals in the 19th century. <clears throat> Following Italian unification, the nation's south was a region that was imagined as uncivilized and resistant to national uniformity and modernity. Marginalized by the north, southern Italy was considered, considered idyllically agrarian and yet socially depraved. Cavalletti Rusticana's explorations of character deviance support these visions. Mascagni relies on Tinta to convey his character's deviancy, suggesting an intrinsic relationship between a distinctly Italian identity and its association with human vice. The textual elements of Cavalleria augment this Verismo-specific vision of Italianness as well. Mascagni mixes lo local Sicilian dialect, Latin, and modern st standard Italian throughout the opera. These linguistic choices portray the character's southernness not only as distinctive, but quite literally deviating from a standard language that was being actively formed in Italy at this time. Mascagni insisted on his faithfulness, faithfulness to Verga's original text by featuring the story's love triangle, quick-paced dialogue, Sicilian setting and dialect, and the character's coarseness. Following a brief orchestral introduction, Toridu sings a pastoral Siciliana, here a serenade in Sicilian dialect, about his lover Lola before dawn breaks. Soft harps resembling a strummed guitar accompany his sensual offstage song, the text dialect derived from the original story. The day then rises to a bustling square on Easter morning. 
A chorus of villagers emerges to welcome the day, singing praise to spring, the fragrant lo local orange trees, and a hymn to the Virgin Mary as bells toll. This is one of the first moments in the opera where Mascagni juxtaposes <clears throat> the idealism of Sicily presented through the chorus community with a darker affective tone articulated by the solo characters. A shadowy light motif, a recurring theme associated with a character or situation, opens the following scene when Santusa, Toridu's naive lover, visits Lucia, his mother. This theme, which occurs many times throughout the opera, reveals that the pastoral quality of the scene is merely a facade. Darkness lies beneath the community's surface. Suspecting Toridu has been unfaithful to her, Santusa asks Lucia where he is gone. The orchestra shifts energetically to accompany the bold entrance of Alfio, Lola's husband. Tensions rise between the three, but an offstage iteration of the Regina Coeli interrupts their secular affairs. In the following Romanza, Santusa returns to Lucia to disclose all that has ensued. With alternations of gentle lyricism and dramatic exclamation, Santusa evokes pity in Toridu's mother. A three-part duet ensues between Santusa and Toridu, the leitmotif weaving through their tense exchanges. Santuzza reveals that she knows of his affair just as Lola Stornello interrupts from a distance. Her street song, Fior di Gaggiolo, initiates an uncomfortable exchange between the three. So obviously her powers of seduction are working in this moment. <laughs> turned off by Santuzza's cloying jealousy and turned on by Lola, Toridu briefly rejects Santuzza. The spurned lover finds Alfio, the scene ending with her impassioned cries of shame and his thirst for blood. The following intermezzo recalls um, the hymns from the first part of the act, indicating that the passing of Easter Mass was ensuing. After the service, the chorus briefly dispenses in happy song, while Toridu heads to the tavern, launching into the drinking song, or Brindisi, Viva il vino spumenciante. The chorus joins in drunken merriment until Alfio reappears. Refusing to imbibe, Alfio dampens the mood and the crowd disperses, sensing danger. The two agree to a fight to the death, initiated in traditional Sicilian fashion by an embrace and bite to the ear. Hmm. A brief reminiscence of the tragic leitmotif sounds during their final solemn exchange. 
a charge duet arises as Toridu returns to Lucia to bid her farewell. Dissonant orchestration accompany screams from a distance, pronouncing Toridu's death. Villagers rush in as Lucia cries in agony and Santuzza faints, ending the opera. The references here to distinctly Italian styles, as opposed to more cosmopolitan influenced writing, showcase Mascagni's attempts to connect local color or the Italian tinte with deviancy and debauchery. Toridu begins the opera with a Siciliana sung in dialect to reveal his unfaithfulness to women in sensuous song. Lola sings the Stornello, a short Italian street song based on a simple ABA poetic form to affirm her illicit involvement with him. Some more subtle details, such as character archetypes or layers of orchestration, further recall an earlier precedent to Verismo, Bizet's exoticist opera, Carmen. Alfio's entrance recalls Escamillo's bullfighter song from Act Two, where like his Spanish predecessor, he struts into the scene to sing a character piece where he brags about upward mobility. The multi-layered soundscape of Cavalleria also recalls Act Four of Carmen. The majority of Mascagni's opera utilizes the idyllic sounds of Easter Mass as a backdrop for the grittier central action, just as Carmen's final act features a joyous bullfight, which accompanies Carmen's brutal demise. Rooted in both scenic design and reminiscence of character pieces, Mascagni's allusions to Bizet's opera speaks to both the popular appeal of exoticism in the late 19th century, but also offers an operatic interpretation of Southern Italy as an exotic space. Unlike Carmen, who is an outsider to her civilian surroundings, Mascagni's central characters are locals. Their own expressions simply recall a regionalized vision of Italianness, Sicilian and lower class, that contrasts with conventional modes of cosmopolitan operatic expression. <laughs> Though the realism of Mascagni's Cavalleria carries both innovative and historically troubling weight, we learn an important lesson about the early origins of operatic realism, one that makes our experience as listeners and spectators all the more human. The stark realities of Italian Verismo are at once messy, moving, and subjective, informed by cultural biases and political agendas, as art often is. We can hear and hold this irony as modern audiences listen thoughtfully and self-reflectively to such histories to adapt Verga's own words from long ago of, quote, reality as it was, or as it should have been. Since 1893, Cavalleria Rusticana has often been paired as a double bill with Leon Cavallo's Pagliacci from 1892, another short opera composed in the Verismo style. Like Cavalleria, Pagliacci highlights the tribulations of impoverished Southern Italian men, and paired together, these historical works can show us an unsavory regionalized picture of Italian masculinity. This is hardly coincidental. As many Italian cultural historians have noted, the Southern Italian man became a source of aesthetic and political fascination from the Risorgimento through fascism. In the snapshot moment of post-unification that we're looking at today, the 1890s, Southern men were by and large considered stereotyped embodiments of many vices that Northerners sought to control. Like Mussagani's work, which features psychological deceit, infidelity, and violence among men, Leon Cavallo's own intervention into Verismo with Pagliacci similarly feeds these evolving stereotypes of brutal masculinity in a distinctly Italian setting. Though born in Calabria and raised in Naples, Ruggiero Leon Cavallo contributed to stereotype notions of Southern Italy through his own investment in Italian Verismo. As an adult, Leon Cavallo settled in Northern Italy, mirroring the large scale migration of Southern Italians to the North at this time. As Leon Cavallo divulged in 1902, 10 years after the opera's premiere, Pagliacci's real life Commedia dell'arte debacle in act two was supposedly inspired by his childhood memories of the murder of his family servant and his lover in Calabria. Leon Cavallo recalls these events in exaggerated terms, quote, I remembered then the bloody tragedy that had gouged the memories of my distant childhood and to the poor servant murdered under my eyes. And in not even 20 days of feverish work, I threw down the libretto of Pagliacci, end quote. Yet Leon Cavallo was not a witness. 
He gained insight about the event from local newspapers, as well as from his father, who presided as the magistrate for the criminal case. As evident in Pagliacci's Calabrian setting and similar themes of murder, toxic masculinity, and jealousy, Leon Cavallo forges a visceral recollection of this scandal. Through his manipulation of memory, he contributes to a vision of the South as a place of grit and brutal crime, exoticizing entertainment and social edification made for Northern cosmopolitan audiences. Premiered two years later after Cavalleria in May of 1892 at the Teatro del Verne in Milan, Pagliacci was exemplary of this uneasy North-South dynamic. The opera's themes of masculine violence and exaggerated behavioral transformation articulated many facets of the Southern question to Northern audiences. Beyond merely fortifying the subject matter already central to literary and operatic Faris Mohavar, Pagliacci voices contemporary attitudes about the problematic position of the Italian man as a suggestionable national subject. Leon Cavallo offers such commentary through the character of Canio, an actor who also embodies the clown Pagliaccio during a large part of the opera. Prior to composing Pagliacci, Leon Cavallo spent the majority of the 1880s in Paris before settling in Milan in 1888. While in Paris, he was introduced to the character Piero, the French equivalent of the Commedia dell'arte clown Puccinella that inspired the character of Pagliaccio. Reconfigured into a depraved and sad figure, Piero became a clown with an explicitly sinister identity crisis. Meanwhile, in Italy, the figure of Puccinella resurfaced in the late decades of the 19th century within Commedia dell'arte festivals. Like his French equivalent, Puccinello resurfaced with and his own identity crisis in Italy as well. In the 1872 essay, Puccinella Inside and Outside the Theater, Giorgio Arcoleo describes that, quote, in character, Puccinella has the stamp of the lowest class of the Neapolitan squatting in the narrow and filthy streets. Superficiality, accidents, transience are the whole world of this character. In words, he babbles. In dialogue, he is ambiguous. In actions, he is uproarious. He is always stupid, be it spontaneously or planned. His home is outside domestic walls. His faith is outside religion. His love is outside the soul. His life is outside conscience. Pulcinella, then, is the Neapolitan commoner who goes around proud of a vacuous and sad heredity. As Arcoleo suggests, Puccinella was not only empty-headed, but vacant, a kind of vessel capable of absorbing any influence of his surroundings. Beyond his own unsavory inclinations, Puccinella, in his vacuous, undeveloped state, lacked any real sense of autonomy. As Laura Bassini has pointed out, the revival of the Commedia dell'arte in both theatrical skits and puppetry throughout the 1870s and 1880s was, quote, part of a growing nationalistic fascination with Italian history, end quote. She further notes that through this history of the Commedia dell'arte, it was often fragmented and regional. The fusion of such characters in festival gatherings, as well as its massive appeal through parodical and satirical skits, were understood as, quote, metaphors for unification, end quote. This observation was complemented by Stuart Steinberg's claim that despite these puppets' regional and often explicitly Southern distinctions, they take on, quote, the character of national subjects, end quote. Yet these reanimated figures, symbolic of unification, were by no means the heroes or even real men that emblematized the Risorgimento. What did it mean then for such malleable characters to be national subjects, to somehow embody the modern Italian condition? Not only the opera's tragic clown and anti-hero, Canio stands within the context of Italian unification as a metaphorical puppet on his own musical strings, offering a sinister appraisal of the contemporary Italian man on the operatic stage. In the act one recitative recitar and the following aria Vesti la Juba, Canio undergoes his transformation from a jealous man into a theatrical character. An imbroglio initiates the scene. A furious Canio threatens to kill his unfaithful wife, Neda. 
and succinct declamation, Pepe, a member of their troupe, tries to calm and disperse the actors as the audience begins to arrive on the other side of the troupe's curtain. Tonio, another member of the troupe, steps in and persuades Canio and cunning sotto voce that it's better to pretend, for Neda's lover will return for the show later that night. Left alone, Canio tries to collect himself before the evening's performance. His moment of candid self-reflection, however, takes on a performative, even ominous turn. In the following recitad, timpani rolls lead to cutting marcato chords through the low winds and strings, signifying a dramatic change of affect. Volatile half-diminished chords, major sevenths and augmented seventh chords underlie Canio's tense melodramatic exclamation. His heightened expression, trumpeting canto declamato, and the histrionic gesture of this one's really hard for me. You know what? I'm going to say it in English. Of sneering laughter with sadness. That's a tough Italian word. Um, contrast sharply with his normative modes of expression. <laughs> Contrastingly, in Un Tal Gioco Credete Mi, Canio's typical lines are characterized by lower to mid-range secco recitative. <laughs> Describing his detachment from his performative role of Pagliaccio through this number, the streamlined mode of singing marks his character's stability. The poignant resignation line of Tu Se Pagliaccio in Recitar alludes to Canio's alternative identity. Through these intrusive shifts between different focal styles, Canio is unable to contain himself within his own pre-established mode of honest expression and sings as if though controlled by an outside force. Vesti la Juba carries this transformative shift further. Canio tries desperately to be his own master by compartmentalizing his pain and channeling it through his actor persona, thus keeping the division between man and clown intact. But his cries of you are Pagliaccio that preceded Vesti la Juba, which in essence we can understand as his proclamation of you are Puccinella or you are an idiot. He preemptively admits his powerlessness even before he struggles against himself in his dejected aria. If we recall Arcoleo's commentary about the character of Puccinella, the vacuous and sad clown that inspired Leon Cavallo's Pagliaccio, we can hear and envision these tendencies clearly within the scene. Canio's identity is absorbed into a buffoonish character, a character who has a reputation as a figure who lacks a sense of self-determination. As a figure that likewise reacts to his surroundings and even another's voice, Canio, as Puccinella, becomes a mere vessel for his own colorful transformation on multiple levels, registering as a puppet even more than as a clown. At his core, he is left ultimately empty, lacking originality or novelty. Though undoubtedly impassioned and harmonically adventurous, Canio's transformation in Vesti la Juba demonstrates a certain ventriloquism beyond the text and notes, for he unwittingly relies on the age-old formal convention of the aria to undergo this change of character. By the 1890s, the aria was considered by some as a trite means of climactic emotional expression. The orthodox use of the form for such a momentous transformation was a point of contention for some early critics of the otherwise successful opera. For instance, a Venetian critic from Il Teatro Illustrato complained, the end of the first act, it seems too conventional to be interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Though Vesti la Juba later achieved great fame due to Enrico Caruso's recordings in 1902, 04, and 09, a number of early critics were enamored instead by scenes where the voice was deployed with what was considered greater originality, including the prologue and the bell chorus of Act One, 
where the ensemble creates an atmospheric imitation of Calabrian church bells. While Leon Cavallo's choice to set Canio's transformation within a conventional melodramatic aria was likely inspired in part by com commercialism, the aesthetic goals of Verismo conflict with this simple explanation, given the various techniques that co the composer used to juxtapose notions of the real and theatrical throughout the opera. Moreover, such traditional modes of melodic expression rooted in melodramatic lyrical singing were understood as unoriginal by progressive critics of the time. As Armin Schwartz has observed based on studies of early Verismo criticism, quote, new realism had made operatic song either implausible or simply non-existent, end quote. Though he further notes that the vogue for performer characters may have been a deliberate and widely used, quote, strategy for getting conventional music in through the back door, end quote. Realism and lyrical singing were nevertheless antithetical, creating an inconvincing or insincere effect through modes of heightened lyrical expression. Furthermore, the sobbing qualities of Vesti la Juba, reinforced by the black tear that is often painted on Pagliaccio's white and faced, recall the tearful sentimental gestures of previous generations of Italian opera, most often performed by women characters. While Canio's connection to these traditionally feminine gestures of tears and lament are somewhat novel in terms of gendered expression, because men always do cry, the magicalisms of his weeping and suffering read more tritely conventional rather than radical. Through these various evocations of past melodramatic conventions, Canio stands as a mouthpiece to outdated modes of expression. Taking into consideration the traditional costume for Pagliaccio, we can understand yet another dimension of the character's puppet-like status. Sketches and early newspaper accounts of the opera display his familiar garb, an oversized white clown shirt with a ruffed collar, a white hat, cropped pants, and heeled shoes. Often, Pagliaccio is shown with his hands entirely covered by long sleeves. Displayed best in, in Caruso's portrayal of Pagliaccio in 1910, he lifts the arms of his costume to reveal his lack of hands. His angular position alludes to a marionette, with a puppeteer oscillating and elevating the puppet's arms in order to portray its liveliness. His intriguing posture, matched with a foolish face, seems derived from an invisible author, the slight contortion suggesting a lack of independent motion. As the embodiment of the buffoonish Puccinella, Canio operates on invisible strings without the brutish authority of his own hands, the tools that eventually aid his revelatory double murder vengeance. To become a real man rather than a Pinocchio-like puppet within his theatrical and operatic framework, Canio must stop lying through feigned expression. Just as Pinocchio became real when his strings were proverbially cut for good, so too does Pagliaccio as he reveals his true identity as Canio in the Act II Commedia. In this scene, an audience is gathered around a stage for the troupe's evening performance. The clowns perform a skit detailing Colombina's unfaithfulness to Pagliaccio, mirroring the real-life predicament between Canio and Neda. Appearing on stage drunk, Canio briefly acts as Pagliaccio within the Commedia, singing in a light serenata style. A timpani roll propels him to reveal himself fully and no, Pagliaccio non son, or no, I'm not Pagliaccio, as of snapping him out of his trance of artifice. In this number, his vocal style alternates erratically. This breakdown of vocal style, dissolving clear-cut markers of recit, declamation, and lyricism that occur midway through this finale number, projects Kanyo's unstable status between theatrical character and real man. Resorting to lyrical singing as he reflects on being blinded by passion, his final eruptions of spite launch his departure into a declamatory vocal style for the rest of the opera, revealing to the Commedia's audience that what they are witnessing is not a part of the evening's original plan. The final victory of declamatory voice as true voice in the finale offers meaningful expressive contrast to Canio's false lyricism in Vesti la Juba. In this meta-commentary on the idealistic nature of lyricism, Leon Cavallo uses this mode of singing to express artifice, an effect that becomes clear when contrasted with the realist sounds of interjectory speech, declamatory singing, and screams that otherwise color this finale scene. Though Canio enacts his own rage-filled truth in this moment, 
the onstage audience understands his real predicament as theatrical and even more captivating than before. Their commentary during, during Kanyo's diatribe against Neda makes this more evidence. They exclaim, bravo! Or in another instance, he's making me cry. The play appears so true. This effect was similarly celebrated by early critics of the opera. One reviewer remarked that Kanyo's aria within the Commedia, quote, takes on a musical form so realistic as to move the audience, end quote. Through the edifying audience and the stage within a stage, we might understand the real theater as neutralized, an illusion suggested in Tonio's prologue that began the opera. As the first level of distant viewing is nullified, the fictional, if briefly, appears non-fictional at the conclusion of Pagliacci. Completing both the performance and the opera, the orchestral reprise of Ridi Pagliaccio from Vesti la Juba washes over the scene after Canio murders Neda and her lover, Silvio. Ultimately, Canio's re revelatory violence is inextricable from performative artifice. Through his fascinating struggle, he undermines reality through his process of aesthetic transformation within the theater, yet he also becomes himself by externalizing his violent interiority and breaking the framework that once controlled his expression. Kanyo thus gives rise to a unique, if deeply troubling, synthesis of subject and author, at once a revolutionary puppet and a real autonomous man. Throughout the early 1890s, Italian opera's obsession with brutality, poverty, and its marked fascination with the psychology of men in the Italian South voiced ongoing cultural anxieties about self-determination within a newly unified Italy. By reconceptualizing these operas with our retrospective gaze, we can broaden our understanding of how social and musical conventions carry significant meanings in the Verismo afterlife. History repeats itself time and time again in the Italian operatic tradition, and the aspiration towards a new modern style espoused by the Giovane Scuola's realism was no exception. Cavalleria's foundational venture within an operatic Verismo signified an immediate blend of convention and fresh novelty. The opera's projection of multi-layered Sicilian noisiness aligned with stereotypical visions of the mezzo giorno. Rustic sounds of sanctity <coughs> provided traditional beauty while musical expressions of exotic southernness overlay the scenic foundation, offering a pessimistic, politicized regional view of Italian debauchery. Conventional references of place and identity, as Pagliacci shows, pervades the work of composers following in Mascagni's wake taking on new signification in light of contemporary conceptions of deviant stereotypes within Italian society. In all, I hope that my talk this evening has showed how Verismo opera voiced larger anxieties about personal identity, expressions of gender, political stereotypes, and the tensions of realism present within late 19th century Italy. Thank you. I welcome questions. <laughs> yes, please. Well, could you give kind of a comparison in your mind between any idealist or miscommunication or misunderstanding of different cultures within the United States, like idealizing the American West or something like that in compare, to compare that to what they did in Italy for the Verismo? Yeah, there's, I mean, uh, exoticism is largely a form of nationalism that um, was rampant throughout many geographies and many locations um, that often relied on very conventional and often exaggerated stereotypes. I think the American West presents a really intriguing comparison with thinking about forms of like hyper masculinity is what we have in this Italian manifestation, um, largely because these roots of Italian realism and nationalism were very, very much became connected with um, fascism and with uh, ideologies of virility. So really, I think those kind of tokens of what we sort of think of as exaggerated within caricatures that are often forged um, by nationalistic efforts have really, really plain comparisons um, across different geographical borders. Where did Leon Cavallo spend his formative years? 
So he he traveled uh, around a bit. He um, was born in Calabria. He was raised in Naples. So he had his pretty much his whole childhood in Naples. And then he moved to Paris as a young adult, um, I believe, to complete training, but also to start writing. Um, and then he settled in Milan in 1888, where I believe he remained for the majority of his adult life. I don't think that he returned to southern Italy on a permanent basis. Did he pick up enough French to get by in, in Paris, or, or do you know? I don't know. <laughs> I, From my knowledge of his operas, because um, Pagliacci is by large, uh, or excuse me, the most um, sort of significant, well-known of his operas, but he did write his own libretto for this opera and for others. Um, but he also borrowed from French resources, um, but a lot of them were translated into Italian. But I assume like many people and frankly, like many um, contemporary Italians, they do have at least like a working knowledge of French. So I would assume that he probably did. But that's an assumption. Do you know why both of the, those composers wrote a lot of the operas? Because I have quite a few of them on CDs, but none of them are ever done. Do you know why? Because some of them are very beautiful. They are. Um, questions of repertory are very tricky in terms of what becomes canonized and what doesn't. Um, I think in the case of Pagliacci, I think that the double murder was kind of um, a token of the work. Um, staging murder in such a brutal way was still a relatively new thing at this moment, because even with Tosca in 1900, Tosca's um, murder of the character Scarpia was considered sort of very radical and very shocking. So I think an aspect of like the violent sensationalism is really important to what uh, grows from repertory into what becomes kind of canonical. And I think largely with the reception history around Cavalleria Osticana, that um, was really, really important to making it considered sort of the first Verismo opera and why it stayed. Um, beyond that, it's, it's kind of a question, I think in certain respects of regionalism, I think some European theaters, particularly some in Italy will stage their works a little bit more often, but they have mostly fallen out of the, the common performance repertory. Um, but that's something I'll continue to think about. Thank you. Yeah, because they're beautiful operas. They both of them did some beautiful full-length operas. Yeah, absolutely. Allison. Um, are there any productions, either more recent or in the past, that you really like because they bring out the themes that you talked about tonight? And if so, tell us about Yeah, so there are... Um, I am frankly a little bit more familiar with Pagliacci. It is one of my very favorite works. So I have um, a lot of context with production history. Um, oh, there's one from 2006 and I apologize that I can't remember. I think it was produced in Germany. I don't remember what theater, but they um, very explicitly staged the kind of meta commentary of like the characters as puppets within the prologue. So they do a whole, um, sort of silhouette staging of the characters as marionettes played through the prologue. So that relationship between the characters, not only as clowns, but like of puppets within sort of like this new theatrical framework is something that a lot of staging directors, I think, have been attuned to and actually were really inspirational for me and my research to kind of take on the metaphor of the puppet that was so prevalent within Italian society in the late 1800s. Um, to really kind of carry that to fruition. Thanks. This is a dumb question. No dumb questions. Um, <laughs> do you feel like, I'm, I'm thinking about what you said of, regarding the themes of masculinity, spectacular violence, Italian opera repeating itself through historical periods. Yeah. My question is, is Verismo like the beginning of the mafioso genre, notwithstanding the American question? And if so, like, are you aware of scholars who have tied the mafia film tradition to like this moment in history in any kind of a way? So explicitly with like mafioso films, not yet. <laughs> film theory is like a whole different animal. Um, but no, there in my larger book project, I do incorporate a lot more of like the ideologies and the development of the mafia. The mafia certainly predated um, the establishment of Verismo from both an operatic and literary perspective. 
Um, but yeah, it is so rich. And the discourses that were evolving at the time that were largely, I mean, I think I stated it in pretty graceful terms, but there are some writers who are really looking to like eradicate a lot of the Southern Italian population and largely because of the darkness of their skin um, and largely because of Northern African influences. Um, this is something I talk about with like the development of eugenics. Um, and so it's all tied together. Um, but in terms of a filmic tradition, not so much yet. Stay tuned. <laughs> I was just going to note, uh, uh, for those many people in front of the seat, I think it's Godfather 3, which takes place during a production of Cavalleria. Yes, it does. Yeah, and they cite um, examples of the music. I believe when the someone's killed. There are a lot of people killed in that movie. They got, I they, they got the scenes out of, scenes from Cavalleria out of order, though. Yeah. yeah, that's a typical filmic approach, you know, the fracture and all that. But no, it's very interesting how a lot uh, Caval um, Cavalleria has been lifted a lot into um, a wide, wide range of films. And of course, has in and of itself been adapted into film. Yeah, could you speak a little bit about the use of folk instruments and folk music idioms throughout Verismo? Um, in one of the examples you played, there was like a guitar style instrument some some folkishness somewhere that you could speak to that yeah um i think in terms of uh the idea of folklore <clears throat> and um any sort of claim to authenticity is really sort of framed by the idea of tinta um or the sense of local color i don't think that in either instance there's any like genuine authenticity and that's such a loaded term in and of itself um but the reference to the guitar this is actually really funny i was talking to my students about references um to guitar and opera actually in a different work earlier today um the best answer i can immediately give you with a sense of certainty is that it's supposed to um invoke both sort of a serenading sound more generally but it's also especially paired with the sicilian dialect meant to represent kind of like a geographical and expressive other um whether that's tied to sort of spanish traditions i cannot say with any kind of certainty um i haven't found anything really meaningful in the literature that kind of um discusses these connections beyond kind of like the superficial framework of tinta but that's something i'll continue to think about Thank you. I saw another hand a moment ago. Oh, wow. Well, my question might be pretty close to Alex as well, but I was thinking about the fictional, you know, construction of the... Uh -huh. um, I was thinking of the, what you talked about, I mean, you had in your screen, the fictional kind of approach to this, like, solid identity, mm -hmm. which I think, like, still pretty much alive in many of these European countries. Absolutely. As well. So my question is, like, when it comes to contemporary productions, um, have you, uh, are you aware of like, ways, ways in which directors have actually confronted that specific aspect? Um, meaning on like the problematic kind of like uh, representation of the Southern character? Well, I think in a sense, you know, from my brief conversations with Neil Long, that this is something that actually the production here at the Lyric Opera is um, seeking to approach, particularly with, um, and Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, we talked about it so briefly, but the idea of like experiencing more from like the element of violence and memory um, and how that becomes in and of itself sort of like, um, I mean, not sort of, it becomes an element of, a, of trauma that's largely politicized. And I know in this production, it's linking both of the works. So starting Cavalleria with the murder at the end and linking into Pagliacci. Um, but in terms of productions that really confront it, I have yet to see something that I really thought had a lot of, frankly, critical punch. I've seen a lot of productions, um, particularly of Pagliacci, that lean into the impoverished element, but it's really kind of like a glorification of poverty and it really doesn't have any sort of critical bite. So honestly, my answer to that is one that's you know, kind of tinged by disappointment. But I'm honestly hopeful for my conversations with Neil um, that this production that will be starting on Saturday um, is taking a critical approach. So I'm really excited to see it and I look forward to thinking critically about that too. Thanks.
Well, as I do often with my classes, we've almost reached the hour of our ending. <laughs> so I say to my students. Um, so if no one has any other questions, um, I appreciate you all being here. And thank you again to Neil for inviting me to be speaker for the series. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you.